On the track is a monthly web TV show about cryptozoology, natural history, green issues, and whatever else the team feel like making up as they go along. Enjoy. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's me, John Glans. And as you can see, the weather is warmer. So warm that I'm not wearing a jumper for the first time. I'm wearing a t-shirt that Lauren Coleman gave me a couple of years ago. I'm sure I thanked you at the time, Lauren, but again, thank you. It's a lovely shirt and I'm very fond of it. Now, why have I got such a big beard? Well, it's partly because I'm too lazy to shave. Partly because my dear late wife had this fixation with um, sort of medieval dark ages warrior dudes and thought that I ought to have a big enough beard that I could plait bones into it. Well, I don't think I ever would have done. But it's the sort of thing that made her happy and as everybody knows, it's the main job of a husband to make their wives happy. And thirdly, because if you want to be a scientist, and I've wanted to be a scientist of some sort ever since I was a little boy, you must have a beard. Look, here is Darwin. Here is Alfred Wallace. In cryptozoology, here's Adrian Schein. And above all, towering way, way, way higher than them all in the firmament of scientific overachievers, here is Professor Hercules Tarragon. As a boy and well into my adulthood, I gasped at the adventures of Professor Tarragon, how, sometime in the late 1930s, he joined the Sanders Hardiman expedition, went to Peru, and amongst other things, brought back the mummy of an ancient shaman called Raskar Kapak and how the spirits were angry with him. And so, one by one, the members of the Sanders Hardiman expedition were struck down with a strange disease that put them all into a coma. He was the last one. But before he was struck into a coma, he was attacked by a glowing ball of light, a fireball which came into his house whisked the mummy away to who knows when and left him absolutely distraught. Well, we're in the 21st century now and although I have a house full of interesting things, I very much doubt whether there's anything I have here that would cause the unquiet spirits to come and destroy me. Uh, I've got a bad feeling about this. I really like the old credits. Oh, well, ladies and gentlemen, I seem to have been miraculously reconstituted after my fiery death at the hands of a mysterious fireball. So, what are we going to talk about today? Well, I've been sitting here, I've been working all morning, and now I've decided to do some filming because I've had enough of doing the stuff I don't really enjoy doing. But one of the things that I did find this morning was this piece of news about a giant sturgeon which is actually in a Detroit river and apparently is the biggest on record. You'll have heard me say all sorts of derogatory things about various parts of the machinations of the American government over the years, but one thing which I do admire the American government for is the fact that all the photographs that they take 
are now automatically put into the public domain. Well done, guys. But back to the fish. This is a river sturgeon and it was caught in the Detroit River a few days ago. And it's six foot ten and probably over a hundred years old. Fantastic creature. And you know what's best of all? The people who caught it, being wildlife biologists, tagged it, measured it, weighed it and let it go again. This next piece of footage is being used under the mechanism of fair use. Jenny's driving, she looks over and she's like, that's a really big fish, like big fish, big fish, get to the back of the boat. We knew it was big in the water, but when we saw it on the deck of the boat, we were all kind of like, okay, yep, yeah, this is very, very large. <laughs> One of the most important things about this story is not just that this fantastic fish exists, but that it exists where it exists, because there has been excessive water pollution of the river from the long-term unregulated dumping of chemicals, industrial waste, garbage and sewage. Much of the Detroit River and its shorelines have been found to be polluted and unsafe for recreational use. Yet, although people aren't able to swim in it, an enormous, beautiful fish can. I think that this is just another sign of how we owe it to the other animals who share our planet to clean up after ourselves. Motor City is burning. Bama, lama, fa, fa, fa. Half a century ago this summer, about six months before my family left Hong Kong for good, I met a little boy called Richard Muirhead. I was 11 and he was about six. And guess what? Half a century later, we're still friends. Apart from a few people to whom I'm related, Richard is the person I've known longest in the world. He's a most peculiar fellow, he writes poetry, he's obsessed with a band called Devo and has been known to wear a funny Devo hat that I bought him. And if that weren't special enough, he's also one of the two best researchers I have ever met. And lucky for us all, his speciality is cryptozoology. I've been wanting to have him on the show for years. We are very proud. To, at last, we bring you a regular section of the show, Nearhead's Mysteries. Okay, so Richard, I can't believe it's been ten years since you started um, flying the snake. Well, very quickly. Tell me. What is flying snake? I mean, I know. But yeah. Tell, tell all the viewers what what is flying snake? And what's it all about? Flying snake is basically a journal, as it says on the masthead on the front cover, of folklore, cryptozoology, and Fortiana, which I started. Issue one was April two thousand and eleven, so I've averaged about two issues a year since then. Um. In practice, it's 90% cryptozoology, 5% folklore, and 5% Fortiana. So it, it is heavily balanced to what I'd call archival cryptozoology, which is anything before 1950. Because I find that the newspapers from the mid-20th century backwards were more interested in unusual animal stories than they are today. So that's basically a, a summary of what Flying Snake is all about. So um, what has changed in the newspaper world then in the last half century and a bit? Well, newspapers no, now are very much more sceptical of w what you could broadly call cryptozoology. They tend to take a rather mocking, negative stance 
although tabloid papers such as the Daily Mirror and the Sun in the UK tend to be more sympathetic and believe these stories are more entertaining for their readers. That's what I, I would say. What made all this, I wonder what made the change. I really don't know. Um, it's kind of modern and know-it-all attitude. Taking the orthodox scientific view that there are no there are no new discoveries to make, but as cryptozoologists we know the new animal species are turning up each year. Um so that's it, it's sort of sad really that there's this kind of overwhelming scepticism. I think our job as cryptozoologists is to make people aware that there are new discoveries to be made out, out there. I think part of it is that we as a species are incredibly arrogant and think we know everything. Yes. We, we don't, as it's patently obvious. We only know a fraction of what there is to know about the universe and how it works. I totally agree with you. I mean, I think we're just skimming the surface. As far as online newspaper archives are concerned, we're, we're just skimming the surface of stories, really. Uh, and if you look hard enough, you can, you can turn up interesting stories even within the UK. So give us some examples. What are your favourite uh, articles you've run in Flying Snake over the last 10 years? Well, I'll read out a list of... Um, all 19 issues of Flying Snake, which I've, I've had a look at this afternoon, and um, in one sentence, I summarise per issue the following stories. Issue 1, Unknown Flying Lizards in Australia. Issue 2, A Spotted Otter in Ireland, circa 1909. Issue 3, and this is a 14 story, Tiny footballers in Barrow Rowan, Ireland. <laughs> oh, come on. You've got <laughs> no, I'm not making that up, honestly. I'm not, I'm not letting you just stay with one sentence on that. Richard, well, that's in issue three. If I don't even listening. What were the tiny footballers? Tell me more about that story. Well, a man was walking across the field. Um, uh, this is from memory. I, I haven't got the issue in front of me, but a man was walking across the field and he heard somebody shout out, Hey! And he turned around and looked down, and all across the field, there were these tiny footballers. And one of them, one of them shouted out, Hey, Jimmy! And then they all disappeared. Or something like that. <laughs> that's from memory. <laughs> and that's in issue three. Okay. That's in issue three, yeah. Carry on with your list, Richard. I, I, I won't promise not to interrupt when you have a story like that. Well, yeah, feel free to interrupt. Yeah, Issue 4, telling the time from cat's eyes. Issue 5... <laughs> well, that didn't last very long. How do you tell the time from cat's eyes? Um, well, again, I haven't got the issue in front of me, but um, I think it depends on the, the shape of the of the iris. You know, sometimes the cat's eyes are like um, kind of oval shape, diamond shape. Apparently during the day this this shape of the eye changes depending on the position of the sun in the sky or something like that. Well that's amazing because it, this is actually quite a good encapsulation of what Fortiana is all about because yeah. the original I, the original concept telling the time from cat's eyes yes. is ridiculous but then when yeah. you explain it it all makes perfect sense it's just something that's come, gone under the radar of human observation I mean, I've only come across this story in one paper one newspaper or journal so it's kind of like a lot of Fortiana it's sort of Half hidden from the human view. Anyway, I'll try to carry on the list. Yes, please, because I'm enjoying this. 
Yeah, me too. Issue 5, Strange Insect that Fell in Bath in 1871. <laughs> Issue no, 6. in Bath or in the Bath? In Bath, the city of Bath in England. Sorry, I was just... I was just <laughs> you mean... <laughs> 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 Issue 6, Snake with Ears, USA. Issue 7, Skin of a Stellar Sea Cow. Now, this was debunked by Carl Shooker. It's a genuine story which was featured on the cover of issue 7. But Carl Schurker looked into it and it, it turned out that it wasn't a stellar sea cow. It was some known species of seal. Issue 8, Toad with Wings in 1869, USA. Issue 9, Flying Snake in Scotland, sometime before 1843. Issue 10, Talking Cat in Germany, 1912. A talking cat. <laughs> Apparently. We're back to cats again. <laughs> so what did the cat say? Well, again, I haven't really... I've only noted just the main the main headlines. I've not really gone into the story much. And so I can't tell you what it said, but anyone who's got flying snake, look in issue 10. Issue 11, Living Mastodon in Borneo, 1926. Issue 12, A Tame Dragon in Norway in the 13th century. Issue 13, Black Triton in Somerset, late 19th century. Okay, what's a triton? Like a salamander. No, I know, they're not supposed to be salamanders in Britain. No. Um, but, so whatever it was, interesting. it was described as a triton in in the book, which is referenced in issue 13, on the, in the Somerset Levels, which is a kind of marshy, lowland, marshy area. Oh, Somerset Levels. So it's an aquatic animal. Strange, what they, sorry? It's a very strange place, the Somerset Levels. One of my books is set there. So. Yes, it seems like a sort of strange, like, almost King Avalon type. King yes. Arthur type place. Anyway, issue 14, Mystery Mustelid, The Kine, in Hampshire, circa 1940. Issue 15, Horned Cat in Oregon, 1873. Issue 16, Giant Owl in Lancashire, 1980. Issue 17, Red Tigers in India, circa World War II. Issue 18, Weird jumping porcupine thing. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd like that one. Oh, Richard, you cannot. You can't say, make it up. Honestly, it all means are genuine stories. But you cannot say weird jumping porcupine thing and expect me not to burst that. <laughs> I thought that would appeal to a sense of humour. Okay, tell me more about the weird jumping porcupine thing. Well, this was high up in the... Um, foothills of the Hindu Kush up in up where Afghanistan meets Pakistan so even today it's a very little explored area even less explored in the 19th century when this story uh, reached the newspaper or book I found it in and uh, I think it attacked somebody it attacked the author of the book, or somebody he knew. And it had, um, it had spines like a porcupine, but it could jump. Oh, I It's a bit vague, I know, but... I love this stuff. <laughs> so do I. Carry on. And finally, finally, issue 19, which is the most recent issue, this is, this is Fortiana again, a story of a computer, an intelligent computer, a computer that was uh, playing somebody at chess, and a computer sort of made up, made up a move, a chess move that wasn't programmed into its um, hardware or software, or whatever. So the computer, it sounds like science fiction, but the computer sort of made up a move that it wasn't programmed to do. So the computer was like thinking for itself. 
And that seems like a horribly prescient way to end, because yeah. self-aware computers are likely to be something which, if the science fiction writers are correct, yeah. if quite other writers who are not fiction writers are correct, is something which is likely to be a big thing in the 21st century. And it, this is not about 1950s, this is way back in the early days, even before home computers. I uh, do have one question, though, Richard. Yeah. I ask this question every month in the, the uh, CSM members' newsletter. Yeah. Where the heck does Richard Muirhead <laughs> find this stuff? Well, really, it's, it's not that difficult, really. If you, if you type it, if you've got access to any online newspaper archive, or if you have access to the British newspaper archive, which you have to pay a subscription to, and if you've got enough time on your hands, you type in the phrase monster, strange creature, strange animal, weird animal, uh, unexpected animal, singular animal. You can, if you've got enough time to trawl through hundreds of thousands of newspapers and you have that phrase in the database you're bound to come up with something that's been overlooked now I've got a library qualification so I, I was taught that at library school I was taught to do this it's all about ch choosing the right search term really and it's just through a computer and it'd be even easier if you had your um, self-aware computer to help you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it would, wouldn't it? It certainly it, would. It would take a lot of work out of it. Yeah. Richard and I have been friends an awful long time, and it's always fun to talk to him. He has this magical, and I use the term deservedly. He has this magical wild talent that Charlie Ford would have called it, of finding stories that nobody else has ever managed to find. And I am very happy that he's been on the show. Now, if you want to contact Richard about subscribing to Flying Snake, his contact details are in the description below. And there's also a link to where you can buy our volume of the collected volume one of Flying Snake and, if you want it, a copy of my novel which we talked about briefly and there which was set in the Somerset levels many years ago. If you want to support us and help us make more content like these Please press like, subscribe, follow our Facebook page and check out our Patreon. And as the ghost of Joe Strummer and I are telling you, please remember to ring that notification bell. Otherwise you won't be told when we've got another show. And that, my dears, is just about it for another episode. Thank you very much to everybody involved, particularly, as always, Graham, Carl and Louis, and Charlotte and Maxine and Sarah, all of whom do their inimitable thing behind the scenes, even if they're not always featured front and centre in front of the camera. It's a great privilege to be able to make shows like this and have you all enjoy them week on week and I hope you continue to support us. Thank you very much all of you who have supported us here on Patreon and every other way and nothing much else to say now. I'll see you next Saturday afternoon 3, 3 o'clock. I nearly said 3.30. I don't know why but it's going to be 3 o'clock. So until then be seeing you.